Welcome back to the Katcha Outdoors podcast. I'm Clayton. I'm your host today, and I'm running solo. Um, I, we get some great correspondence from Riley, so shout out to Riley. Thanks for sending these questions in. But he had some questions about the rules and regulations, specifically in California, uh, surrounding hunting, do's and don'ts. Um, so I'm going to go through his questions. They were they're awesome. Um, I think they're great for new and experienced hunters to either know or review keep kind of front of mind when you're out there. So we're going to walk through those, those questions today, but before I jump into it, um, I want to tell you guys a story specifically about regulations and something where, uh, this is a story where I almost got in big trouble. I made an honest mistake. Um, and I'll tell you how I, uh, how I approached it when I found out I had made the mistake. So this is about, oh gosh, seven years ago, maybe. And uh, Ben and I had done a backcountry hunt and opening morning, this is a rifle hunt, opening morning I had killed my buck like in the first hour or two. So we cut everything up, put it in our packs, packed it back to camp, and then um, decided we were just going to go ahead and take it all the way to the trailhead and put it in, in the truck. So we packed out and when we got to the truck... Uh, Well, let me go back. So when I first killed my deer, obviously I filled out my tag. I did everything I was supposed to do. I attached the tag to the antler of the buck, just like the regulations say. So we pack out the deer, we get it back to the truck and it was, um, it was pretty warm still. So, and it was an open bed truck. There was no camper shell or anything. And we had, we had stuffed the, the ice chest full of the meat and we decided um, we're going to, I'm going to put these antlers underneath the truck and hide them because if I put them in the truck, they're going to be sitting in the heat for days, who knows how long, just rotting. And it's going to stink up the truck. So I decided what I'll do is I'll just tuck them underneath the truck, like up inside the, you know, the underside of the truck, like above the frame or whatever, just out of sight. Um, I just didn't want them to get stolen. There were several trucks at the trailhead. Just wanted to protect the antlers. So the meat went in the in the coolers, coolers went in the truck, antlers were hidden underneath the truck. So we pack back in and Ben winds up killing his deer the following morning. So we're now, you know, a day and a half into the hunt. We do everything we're supposed to do with his deer. He fills out his tag. We pack it out. We decided we'd fill our tag. So we went back to camp, broke down camp, got back to the trailhead. And so it's like Sunday afternoon by this point. We get to the trailhead and two game wardens were there. Now, on the way to the trailhead, I remembered, like it dawned on me, that I had screwed up. So if you're familiar with California tags, part of your tag, like if it's that long strip, right? Part of it is your harvest report and part of it is your actual tag. So what I had done, rookie mistake, I had filled out the harvest report in full detail, just like I was supposed to do for my tag, but it wasn't my tag. I was just, you know, I guess too psyched up from killing this buck. It was the biggest buck I had killed in my life, you know, just whatever. So I had filled out the harvest report, attached the harvest report to the deer and kept the the rest of it in my bino harness. It's where I keep all my tags. And as we're hiking to the trailhead, we're about a mile and a half to the tra- from the trailhead and it dawns on me, oh no, I have a tag in my bino harness and I have a harvest report attached to my deer. So... As luck would have it, there's two game wardens at the trailhead checking everybody. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to be totally honest and tell them that I screwed up, I made a mistake, and they can do with it what they want. So one of the officers, his name is Officer Rose, I forget his first name, but one of the coolest game wardens I've ever met. And in fact, that was the first year we ran into him. We, we met him in the, out in the field um, probably three years in a row. Awesome game warden out there doing his job. He's respectful. Um, anyways, so that was our first run in with, with officer Rose. He was with his partner. I don't remember his partner's name, but so I said, okay, guys, I messed up. I filled out the harvest report instead of the tag. I still have the tag in my bino harness and they both just kind of looked at me. And (laughs) as I'm, as I'm telling him this, I'm, we're crawling under the truck and grabbing antlers out from under the truck. It just, the whole thing just looks suspicious. I get it from their perspective. But I said, hey, I'm just being honest. Um, this is what I did. Filled out the harvest report. I'll fill out the tag right now. Honest mistake. So rewind back to archery season. Officer Rose had already checked Ben because um, it was archery season. And he wanted to check Ben uh, to see if he was carrying a firearm. 
So he had already kind of made the acquaintance of us. <laughs> so he looked at me and he said, you know, I've, I've run into you guys before. I've checked you guys before. I'm going to take you in good faith that this was an honest mistake. Um, just fill out your tag, put it on the antlers and, you know, no better next time. And his, off, his partner said, if it was me, I'd write you up right now. I'd give you a ticket. So the reason I tell you that story is when it comes to the rules and regulations of hunting, the people you'll be dealing with for the most part are game wardens. And there's a lot of really awesome game wardens out there. They do an excellent job. Like 99% of the game wardens we run, we run into in the field, they're great. They're great people. So they're out there to do a job. Um, they're dealing with armed individuals who know how to use their weapons. So it's kind of a it's kind of a, a shifty situation that they're put in anyway on a day to day basis. So I respect that. I respect the risks that go along with the job that they do. But one, one bit of advice I wanted to put at the beginning of this podcast, when it comes to working with dealing with game wardens is always be honest, just be honest. If you screw up, you screw up, you just deal with it. Um, they're regular people too. Most of them are hunters too. They know that people make mistakes. Uh, the second you try to hide something, that's when you're going to get yourself in trouble. So if you do wind up making a mistake in the field, um, be open and honest about it. That's the best way to approach it. And oftentimes, well, I can't speak for, for every, every officer, but the officers we've run into, if there was a mistake made like the one I made, I was just honest about it, told him exactly what happened. And in good faith, he, he trusted that what I was saying was true. I didn't try to hide it. I could have said, no, I haven't killed anything yet um, and kept the antlers hidden under the truck. And then if they so happen to, you know, check our coolers for meat, they're going to be like, where's this meat coming from? You obviously poach something, you're under arrest. So it just doesn't, it doesn't pay to be dishonest, try to hide anything. Just, just be honest, forthright, and tell them exactly what happened. So let's jump into it. So Riley says, hey guys, thinking mostly about deer and bear hunting. Here's a long list of some questions I've had after reading the regs. I'm sure other listeners could contribute more and or better questions. So I'm going to run through these questions. It's specific reg regulations that he's asking about. So the first one is legal shooting hours. He asked, where can I find official sunrise and sunset times to plus or minus 30 minutes? So if you're familiar with the regulations, you can hunt 30 minutes before sunrise, 30 minutes after sunset. So what we use is our simply our Apple uh, weather app. So it'll tell you the exact sunrise and sunset times. I'm sure, I haven't checked, but I'm sure like Onyx Maps will do the same thing. Uh, maybe they don't, I don't know. But there's a lot of apps out there that will tell you exact sunrise and sunset times. In fact, if you're worried about it, you can go online and Google for your region. So it might be a few different it might be different uh, times based on where you are in the state, north and south, east and west, by a few minutes. So you can go print the the uh, sunrise and sunset times ahead of time from a website, a reputable reputable website, and just have it in your pocket as a reference. But it's pretty simple. Um, it's half an hour before the listed time on the Apple Weather app, and then half an hour after the sunset time. I would say don't overthink it. Just use common sense with this one. Uh, if if it's too dark to see an animal in your sights, it's clearly too dark to hunt. So even if that's, you know, 20 minutes after the listed sunset or 20 minutes before sunrise, then it gets down to hunter ethics. If it's uh, if sunrise is 6 a.m. and it's 545 a.m. and you see an animal moving and you look through your rifle scope and you can't tell what it is, it's too dark to shoot. Don't take a shot. It's pretty simple ethics. But that's how we find our, our sunrise and sunset times is uh, just using the Apple app. Next question. What exactly does forked antlers in the upper two thirds mean? The reason that regulation reads like that is to differentiate between an eye guard and an antler. If you have some kind of genetic malfunction in, an, in a deer, in a buck, there's a chance that he could grow a spike with an eye guard. That does not count as an antler fork. So in the, if you're looking at a deer, like a side profile of a buck, and you see his antler come out of his head, that upper two thirds is where the antler will split off into forks. Anything in that bottom third will be an eye guard, and that doesn't count as a, as a point. If you have 
like I said, some random situation where um, a spike grows an eye guard. I wouldn't say that's very common, but that, that doesn't count as an antler. So you're looking at the top two thirds of the antler for forks off of that. And you want to differentiate between the forks and the eye guards. Next question, how do I identify a legal bear? So as the regulations read it, a legal bear is one that does not have a cub with it. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, you're probably thinking, well, that, that leaves a lot of gray areas. What if I see a cub? And we've run into that. So two years ago, um, we saw a bear that was by itself, but it was cub sized. But some of these black bears run really small. That's pretty much it. If the bear is clearly a sow with a cub, then don't shoot it. It's pretty simple. So you're always looking, you're always checking to make sure that you don't see a cub anywhere with a bear. And sometimes it's not so easy to differentiate between sows and boars in the field because some of the boars are just small um, and some of the sows are big. Uh, Ben's bear that he shot a couple years ago was um, just as big as a lot of the boars we see out there, <clears throat> just an old sow. So as long as that sow doesn't have a cub with her, you're good to harvest. And um, as far as the size goes, even if it's a small bear, you're free to harvest as long as that, that, that bear is not with um, a mother. So a lot of times they'll be, uh, they'll be on their own within the first year or two, and, and they're still just not that big. So something I, I want to pause here and, and make this note. This is just, this video, this podcast is strictly for reference purposes only. You have to go look at the regulations for yourself. That is the law. So each of us hunters have to go read the regula regulations and have that knowledge for ourselves. Um, I will never be, this channel will never be the resource for rules and regulations. I can just tell you our interpretation of them, what, what our understanding is. But ultimately, you have to read these regulations for yourself. So that's just a little, a little uh, disclaimer there before we keep going. Next question, how do you tag a deer? Um, how do you get a deer or bear um, co-signed? So in California, if you're not familiar with the regulation, you have to have your tag signed off by an authorized person. For deer, there's actually a long list of people that can sign off on your deer tag. Uh, of course, game wardens, anyone from California Department of Fish and Wildlife offices, but also Cal Fire employees, um, Postal employees, local law enforcement, uh, you're actually your, uh, your butcher. A lot of times your butcher can do that. They're authorized to do so. There's a long list of people that can, that can sign off on your deer tag. That's not the case for bears. So bears are pretty specific. They have to be signed off by either a game warden or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, there's a specific office. I think it's the Oh gosh, the, the biology office or something. There, there's a, there's a phone number on the website that you can call as soon as you get back into cell range. You have to do it as soon as possible for both deer and bear, as soon as you possibly can. Obviously, if you're up in the mountains and you kill a deer, you put it in your, in your ice chest, um, and there's no cell reception, you can't go validate it unless there's a game warden around. So the, the expectation is as soon as you get back into a realistic time frame, you get, you get out of the woods, you're back on the highway, stop, call somebody, uh, make arrangements to get your tags validated. So when it comes to bears, I'm going to read you the regulation. If a bear is taken, the bear must be validated by a CDFW, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, employee before transporting the bear, except for the purposes of taking it to the nearest CDFW employee authorized to validate the bear tag. So the point is, you can't go try to take your meat to the butcher, um, take your hide over to the taxidermist, and then figure out your tag later. No, you have to go straight to get it validated first. That's the first thing you're, you're supposed to do. Same thing for deer, but you just have a lot more um, options when it comes to deer tag validations than you do bear. So it's either a game warden or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife office. So go online and just Google search how to validate a bear tag in California and you can follow the links there to find the phone numbers to call. But I would recommend having that phone number ready to go. So if you do validate a bear, you can immediately call um, and set an appointment. So the next question is, do you have to keep evidence of sex in California? In California, uh, as far as deer go, you keep 
the antlers and the meat. Those are your two requirements. And the antlers are obviously your, your proof of sex. And the tag has to be attached to the antlers. In other states, it's different. The tag has to be attached to the carcass. Um, each state's a little bit different. But in California, the tag has to be on the antlers, and that's your proof of sex. With a bear, the requirement is to keep the hide and the head and show it in the validation process. When you show it to California Department of Fish and Wildlife employees, they will oftentimes pull a tooth. So you also need to prop the mouth open. So when you first kill your animal, put a stick or something in the mouth two or three inches long. That way, when rigor mortis sets in and it, the jaw locks up tight, you can still they can still access the the teeth to pull the pull the tooth. And it's great for research purposes too. When they pull that tooth, they age the bear. They look at genetics. They look at whatever, whatever they've been eating, health stuff. I don't know what all they look at, but it's great for research purposes. I think it's a cool thing. Next question. Exactly what are you packing out and leaving after a kill? Our goal when we kill an animal is to harvest the edible parts of that animal. The gray area is internal organs. I'm, I don't really eat heart or liver, so I'm not, that's not something I'm going to keep. But when it comes to meat, I'm going to take all the meat of that animal. That's my responsibility as a hunter. That's your responsibility. And it's the law. The law states that you take the edible parts of the animal. You don't have to pack out the bones. What we do is we use the gutless method. So we, uh, the way I like to do it is make an incision on the, like behind the neck of a deer and then make a cut down the spine and then skin down towards the legs uh, and down the belly. And then I'll take off the front quarter the hind quarter, the neck, the back straps. And if there's any rib meat that's um, salvageable, that's usually just my, it goes in my grind bag. Rib meat, um, what's that? That layer of meat that's over the ribs. I forgot what it's called. So <clears throat> you can do that. Then I'll, I'll roll the animal over, do the same thing on the other side. And the very last thing I'll do is reach just inside uh, the spine, make a small incision and go in just below the spine and get the tenderloins out. So I'm taking all the edible parts of the of the deer, the bear, whatever it is. That's the goal. I'm not going to leave anything out there. And if, as far as the hide goes, like, like I said earlier with bears, the rule, the, the law says you have to take the hide out for validation purposes. So you're going to have to pack that hide out. You don't have to pack a deer hide out if you don't want to. Some people like to keep a buckskin. Some people don't. That's your prerogative, but you have to take the meat. You have to take the antlers. You don't have to take the whole head if you don't want. Um, I've taken just the skull cap before, just cut off the skull cap, taking the antlers and then the meat. It's your, it's your choice, but you have to have the antlers with your, your tag attached to it and you have to have the meat and a game warden will want to see both. They're going to want to look in your coolers. They're going to want to see the meat. Um, sometimes they'll even open the bag and see like, okay, there's a quarter, there's, there's a hind quarter, front quarters, back straps. Okay. You took the whole animal. There's your antlers. Everything's here. So they want to see that you have everything there. All right, next question is regulations around keeping a weapon in your car while road hunting. This is one that we've been stopped several times by game wardens to, and they've checked us. The rule is you can have a firearm with you, like in the cab or the front seat or whatever, when you're not on pavement. So when you're not on pavement, when you're on dirt roads, you can have that firearm with you and it can be loaded, but you cannot have a bullet in the chamber. So you can have, like, a, I have a, a three-round clip in my hunting rifle, um, and then I would just put one in the pipe um, when I'm ready to shoot. As long as I keep the bullets in the clip and not in the pipe when I'm driving, I'm legal. And yes, you will be stopped and checked. So what they'll do is they'll stop you, come up to the window, ask to see your firearm, so you'll hand them your firearm, they'll open the bolt or the slide or whatever, and they'll check to, to make sure there's no bullets in the chamber. If you do have one in the chamber, you're going to get busted. And it's not safe. It's just not safe to drive around with a bullet in the pipe. Whether you have the safety on or not, um, anything can happen. So that's the rules around having a weapon in your car. The next question is about carrying a sidearm while hunting. If you are rifle hunting, you can carry 10 sidearms if you want. Carry your whole arsenal. Archery hunting, no firearms are allowed. So it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. You're on national forest. It's 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 open carry on national forest. It's public land. 
So you can have your sidearm if you want with your rifle, no problem. But when you're archery hunting, when you have an archery tag, you cannot carry a firearm at all. Not in your backpack, not on your, not open carry, not anywhere. That's the rules. Next question is an interesting one. Explain exactly what qualifies as baiting. Is a natural salt deposit considered baiting? What about hunting near wells and springs? Anything that occurs naturally that nobody puts there, that you didn't put there, nobody else put there, that's not baiting. That's just the landscape. It would be the same thing as if there's a a particular, um, like there's a small burn pocket with some really great seral forestry in there and deer are just coming and and eating there regularly. That's not baiting. That's just a naturally, naturally occurring forage for that animal. Same thing with salt, same thing with water. Anything that's naturally occurring is not baiting. If it's anything that has to be added to the landscape, food, uh, salt, anything like that, that's baiting. So you, you're free to hunt anything that's naturally occurring. You can, you can ambush over a spring, a creek, river. If there's some sort of like mineral deposit in the ground that's naturally occurring, you can, you can hunt over that. It's naturally occurring. So baiting is anything that's artificially added to the landscape. This is another good question. Does someone joining the hunt but not shooting need a hunting license if they are just coming along and helping pack meat? No. This is another situation that goes back to honesty with game wardens. I've taken a lot of people hunting with me that don't have a hunting license. They're just coming along for the experience. They have every legal right to do so. Where it gets dicey, and you have to think of it from the perspective of a game warden, when he rolls up to your vehicle or he runs into you in the woods, let's say you're out um, hiking a trail and you've got your hunting rifle, maybe a sidearm, but you also have your hunting license and tag. But then you have two buddies with you and both of them have sidearms and they say, oh, it's just for protection purposes. Then it starts to get dicey. You have to look at it from the perspective of the game warden. The game warden's going to look at that as why do these guys need sidearms? for protection. They're with somebody who has a sidearm. They don't have hunting tags and licenses. There's a good chance that these people are up to no good, that they're going to go poach something. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area when it comes to um, some of these, the application of some of these rules and regulations in the woods. Like I said, technically speaking, technically speaking, anybody can go out to, to public land as long as they're legally authorized to own a firearm. It's registered in their name and all that. They can go take a firearm in the woods. They can go target practice. There's an, there's an intersection of common sense and rules and regulations. So while there might be a loophole in the rules and regulations in certain situations where, yeah, um, my buddy doesn't have a hunting license and tag but wants to carry um, a hunting rifle with him, in terms of the the letter of the law, he might be able to, but what's the common sense here? What's it going to look like if my buddy's out there and you know, he's sitting on the trail and I decide to go glass down this hill and he's by himself and he's carrying a, a hunting rifle with him with no license and no tag? It just looks really bad. That's the, what that's what the optics say. It's just common sense. So use your brain. Like if I was going by myself out to the National Forest and it was during a hunting season, but I had no license and tag, I probably would just stay out of the woods. Because if I don't have a license and tag and I'm carrying firearms around, it just doesn't look good. It's the optics of the thing. Not to say it's illegal, but it's uh, you get into those situations where the, the game warden has to make a choice. You're forcing a game warden to make a choice. Is this person doing something illegal? Is their intention illegal? You're just kind of painting a target on your chest. And so my, my word of advice for all that is to, uh, this, someone told me this when I was young and I've never forgot it, err on the side of caution. So don't, don't be aggressively pushing the line. Just be cautious with what you do. Use common sense. That's the long answer. The short answer is, yeah, take your buddies with you to pack meat. That's fine. Just, just be cognizant of the, the optics of what you're doing. So maybe they don't carry a, a firearm. Just carry a pack. You have the firearm already. They don't need one. No one's, nothing's going to kill you. Be aware of the optics of what you're doing, how you're handling yourself, the perception of that game warden that you might run into in the woods. What qualifies as spotlighting? 
is using a normal headlight okay? Again, this is one of those situations where you have an intersection between common sense and legality. Common sense would tell you when you're hiking out at night, which I, I love night hiking, okay? If you're hiking out at night and you're using uh, one of those light cannons that lights up the entire forest, and you're stopping and you're and you're looking in the woods and you're stopping and you're looking in the woods and you've got a firearm with you and it's loaded and and you've got one in the chamber but it's 11 o'clock at night or two in the morning what are the optics of that technically speaking it's legal to do those things to use a flashlight while you're hiking but what are the optics of what you're doing if you were a game warden and you uh, were hiking down a trail at midnight just checking for people and you see someone coming towards you with a fully loaded, fully loaded firearm, stopping every few feet with a really, really bright spotlight, not a headlamp, a spotlight. And they're shining that spotlight in the woods left and right. And then they're walking a little bit, shining it in the woods left and right. What do you think they're doing? Do you think they're hiking to their truck or, or looking for a water source or a good place to camp? Probably not. You're going to think these people are up to no good. So just be mindful of the optics of what you're doing. Now, that being said, it's 100% fine to have your, your um, headlamp. It's recommended. Like, wear a headlamp. Just be safe in how you do it. Use common sense. Use your headlamp for hiking. Don't stop your vehicle on a dirt road at 11 p.m. and shine your light around. Here's the best way to kind of summarize the typical game warden's perspective, and I'm not trying to speak for them, it's just common sense. If you're doing something in the woods related to animals or possibly related to animals, is it a normal hunting activity? It's like the NBA. They have the, the flagrant foul rule. And if, if you do something that's not a basketball act, then it's deemed as a flagrant foul and it's, it's more aggressively penalized. So if you take a whack at someone's head and the ball's over here and you whack their head, you, it looks like you're intentionally targeting their head, even though you might not be. The same thing applies in the woods. If you're doing something that's, a, that's not typical to a hunting act, you're just putting a target on your chest. So remove the gray area, err, err on the side of caution, use common sense. You don't need a spotlight to hike to your, to your tent, to, to find a camping spot. A headlamp is just fine. Headlamp is all you need, it's totally fine. You don't need to walk around with your gun fully loaded in your hands with a spotlight at two in the morning. You just don't. Those aren't normal hunting things to do, right? You're not even supposed to be hunting 30 minutes after sunset, 30 minutes before sunrise. So what's the point of doing all that? Same thing with if you're in your vehicle and you're driving down a dirt road at midnight, don't shine your light out the window. You don't need to. It's not a, it's not a normal hunting act. So the assumption would be, if from a game warden's perspective, most likely if I see someone driving down the road, stopping, shining their spotlight around the woods at midnight, they're up to no good. The next question is, is hunting deer from a boat okay as long as it is being propelled only by human power? That I don't know. That's a really great question. And that's one of those that I would say, go, go read your, re your regulations thoroughly. If you have questions, call the uh, Fish and Wildlife Office and ask them about it for clarity. I've never hunted using a boat at all. So that's something I couldn't speak to. It's a good question. My one thought on that, the reason I wanted to even read that question, not knowing the answer is it goes back to what I was saying about removing the gray area, using common sense. If you have to ask that question, like think of it from a game warden's perspective. If, if there is a rule, and again, I don't, I don't know this. I don't hunt with boats. Never, never wanted to. Uh, if the rule says, you can't hunt in a, in a powered watercraft, for example. Well, I'm just not going to hunt in a watercraft, from a watercraft. I'm just not going to do it. It's just, I'm removing the gray area. So, <clears throat> erring on the side of caution, like I said. So, the last few questions I have here pertain to national forest and BLM rules. First one is open and concealed carry allowed. Yes, on national forest, when you're off of paved roads... You can carry your firearm on your on your person. You can carry it in your pack. Um, it's public land. You can do so. Next question is, can you shoot over logging roads or bodies of water? 
No and no. So you never want to shoot over a body of water in case you do miss and you hit water. Bullets can ricochet off of water. It's dangerous. Secondly, as far as the roads, uh, the rules are pretty specific about roads. You cannot shoot over roads. So the next question is how to do target practice on public land. Is target practice where you plan to hunt a bad idea? So first part of that question, how to do target practice on public land, it's pretty simple. Clean up after yourself. So it's like I said earlier, it's legal to go shoot. In fact, I just did it a couple weeks ago, public land. But just clean up after yourself. Don't leave shell casings and targets and paper and bottles. Just clean up after yourself. Have good ethics. Uh, don't shoot over roads, from roads, over bodies of water. Follow all the rules and regulations and you're free to, to go target practice. As far as practicing where you plan to hunt, is it a bad idea? Absolutely, it's a bad idea. One of my pet peeves growing up um, in, my, in our hunting spot over in C-Zone there, there was this same camp every year. We had our, we had like a favorite spot on a certain mountain where I killed my first deer actually. And every year, the night before opener, it was like World War III up there. Just boom, boom, boom. I'm like, come on, man. You're just let it, letting every animal within a five mile or four mile radius, um, however far the distance travels up there, letting them know that you've arrived and you've got guns and you're out to hunt. Like, they're not stupid animals. There's a reason the success rates are so low. Don't be shooting in your hunting spot. It's like swimming in your fishing hole. You just don't do it. So <clears throat> use your, do your target practicing somewhere, somewhere else, not in somebody else's hunting spot, hopefully. But go to the range, um, go prior to season, get that done beforehand, or just find a spot that's not a likely hunting spot for anybody if you need to put a few target um, shots out. A couple year, years ago when we were in Idaho, our guns kind of got thrown around on the drive up so we stopped we found a spot that was just it was wide open there was just some rolling hills nobody was hunting there no animals either so we set up some box targets did some target practice cleaned up our mess and left something like that something that's that's uh, ethical for other hunters um, for the animals around it's just that's the way to approach it clean up after yourself and use common sense when you're doing your target practicing don't blow out somebody else's hunting spot um, and you, you'll be good to go. So the last few questions are about timberland. Do timber companies typically allow hunting on their land? What about camping? Where can we find more info on this? Great questions. So timber companies that own land most of the time allow free access for hunting. However, they are the owners of the land. So if they decide that there, there's a high fire risk or if they decide no dispersed camping on their lands, uh, if they decide, you know, we have logging activity in here, we're closing this portion of the forest down, that's their prerogative. That is their land. The way you find more information about it is you have to go to that company's website. So Collins Pine, uh, Sierra Pacific, um, all these these big timber timber companies in California, you would go to their specific website and find out more information about their the land that they own. It's a it's a long term partnership between their land, national forest, and the hunting community. So it's not like uh, this is a new thing. This is this is old. Uh, they've been doing it for a lot of years. There's a lot of in information readily available on their website, and again, you can always call uh, get clarity. Uh, oftentimes you'll see, especially when there's elevated fire risk, um, if they do allow access, they'll say no camping at all because then you run the risk of people building fires or lighting stoves or whatever and, and causing fire. And that land represents their in, their company income. You have to look at it from that perspective. So respecting the land and the rules that they have for their land helps in maintaining this, this long-term partnership because they don't have to allow access uh, if it's their land. So <clears throat> This is a, a good faith agreement between national forest hunters and the timber companies. So we all have to do our part to keep that going. Uh, but yeah, definitely go to their website, check it out, and you'll learn more information. And fingers crossed we don't have a, a bad fire year this year because that's usually what causes the closures is uh, elevated fire risk or active fires going on. I mean, if you think of the Dixie Fire, for example, I think that's uh, Sierra Pacific up there. And they lost, man, who knows how many millions of dollars in revenue from that fire. So, all right. 
We got through the questions. Those are great questions. I just want to throw this out there. If you have any questions, thoughts, uh, we try to read every single email, every bit of correspondence, comments on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we try to stay in touch with all of it. So we're, we're reading the stuff you send us and we appreciate the feedback. And obviously we don't know everything, but we'll tell you what we do know. We'll share the information. And if it helps, awesome. Let us know. We love to hear it. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you on the next episode.